what a hit. What can she do here? Wonderful footwork inside and out again. Oh, lovely work from Harrison to find the gap. Oh, steps one way, then the other. Hello and welcome to All In, the show all about the Alliance Premier 15s. Delighted to have you all with us. I'm joined by Gloucester Hartbury and England scrum half Mo Hunt and former London Irish and England winger Topsy Ojo. We must address the elephant in the room and that is Mo's head. <laughs> Mo, what happened? Uh, basically, as a scrum half, don't take a quick tap seven metres from the line and run into the seven. Um, yeah, run into Claire Malloy, who's just an unbelievable player. And yeah, they, um, the stitches are kind of telling the story for themselves. Yeah, it looks pretty painful. I think you got off more lightly, though, shall we say? Yeah, bless her. So Malloy um, like broke her nose quite badly. Um, she just went to try and go really low and it just, yeah, it was a bit of a nasty collision, like rugby collision. So wishing her all the best for her um, appointments Fine, yeah. this week. You can barely notice it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying <laughs> really <laughs> hard to hide Pointed it. it out to everybody watching or anything. Anyway, coming up, we're celebrating the great and the good of women's rugby. Jodie Owensley's inspiring story, born profoundly deaf, but now ripping it up for sale sharks. The world's best players are flooding to the AP15s. We'll find out why and what they make of our life in England. What is it like to live and work with your partner, literally together 24-7, and then face them down in international rugby? Mo, Topsy, we've had five rounds of the AP15s so far. Bristol and Saracens are currently unbeaten. Bristol are top of the table. What is your assessment of what we've seen? I think for me it's just the physicality, the intensity, everything about it, like playing in it this year seems to have like an extra 20% like of what I've ever experienced before. Like the game we played against Bristol at home was the hardest 40 minutes of defence we have ever had and that, that wasn't just me like as a scrum half, like Zoe Allcroft, players like that were saying it as well. So yeah, there's just an extra bite about it this season which has been amazing. And it's been real noticeable as well, like that uptick in intensity, the pace of the matches as well. I've loved the quality of the tries. There's been some unbelievable scores if I was going to pick two which I saw at the <laughs> time and I was like <laughs> sorry <Don't> guys, it. <laughs> it's coming <laughs> Laura Sheens for Exeter unbelievable that counter attack and then Abby Dow's one two three third <laughs> third one <laughs> against Gloucester Hartbury but that, that's just a snapshot of the quality of the tries that we've seen it's been brilliant to watch it's been so so good we've been ripping though so far yeah. sorry <laughs> first five minutes of the show are just ripping it's all friendly yeah. we're all friends it's all it's right it's all, time, good. It's all good it's all good well, we had a brief chat there about some of the standout moments. Let's take a look now at the best bits from the first five rounds. Looking to try and spin it wide again, and here she is again, right to the heart of it. Emily Scott bursting through the line. Can she finish this off? Steps wonderfully, and again, looking to try and find a teammate. Another debut try. Vicky Irwin at the back of the line-out, secures clean line-out possession, it goes Holly Borden, she's in acres of space, the former Loughborough centre, Borden drops a shoulder, can she get through? Yes she can! Terrific score from Holly Borden! Evan Reid had a little look, oh and then Hesketh, then back to Reid, Murray on the outside, or on the inside, but now Murray gets it from the outside, and Murray for the corner for Bristol Bears. Again, the lightning drive initially gets a shove on. That's a superb pick up and run from Miller Mills, carrying it in two hands and looking to offload the ball. That's wonderful. Here is Abby Dow inside, and out goes Abby Dow. This will be a 50th try for Wasps. What a stunning, stunning score! And, oh, lovely work from Harrison to find the gap. Oh, steps one way, then the other. Bradley. Changes the call. Robinson has to throw it on. And here comes Kobayashi. Kobayashi has Duncan outside, opts to kick through. It's Sheehan! Sheehan is away! Laura Sheehan! Driving for Exit the Glory! Ellie Kildon! Where was that gap? And here comes Ellie Kildon, she stays on her feet, it's a sublime balancing act! Wanting 
to go quickly. Oh, and it might work out for the Chiefs here because Zalika Menin is going to go all the way. Nice though as Kira Bevan picks and goes. This is Jazz Joyce, she'll take some stopping from here. Oh, she turns Eddie Kill down inside out. They're chasing back, but they won't catch Jazz Joyce, who loves scoring at the stoop. Some absolutely brilliant rugby in there. Mo, Topsy, some standout moments there? I think for me, like, being back at the stadiums now, having fans back, having that noise and that buzz, there has been a genuine, renewed and increased interest in the women's games. You know, we started before the men's, they had their own window, but even since then, the fact that you can watch first weekend, five live streams, afterwards, two live streams per round, the visibility is there, the access is there. You know, you can see the numbers, the numbers watching the live streams, the numbers watching the highlight shows as well. It's just been brilliant to be a part of, having that noise back in your ears, as a commentator, it took a bit of getting used to it at the start. You're like, wow, it's loud. Okay, I need to turn everything up. But it's just been great to have that back. It's been so good. Yeah, I think for me as well, like you mentioned it, but having fans back, like we've had some of the Hartbury lads come down with a drum for our Harlequins game. It just makes such a difference. But personal highlight for me, just having the family back in the crowd. Like my um, both sisters have had little babies. So my niece and nephew have come and watched. And yeah, stuff like that just means the world to me. So having them back in the crowd is, has been amazing. I think we all took for granted being in stadiums and being around crowds and that noise. And you go back in now, it's goosebumps stuff, isn't it? It must be for you playing on the pitch. Yeah, like I said, like we've never had a drum at the ground before and like it was just unbelievable. Like the like you really felt it on the pitch and when you're like under the pump and like the team's coming at you, like just stuff like that makes a huge difference, especially when you're home. So no, yeah, it's been amazing. It's been um, game changing really. And the players have certainly raised their game to the crowd as well. Mo, I want to draw your attention to this clip. I absolutely love it. Two very chirpy nines getting straightened out by the referee. You were actually in commentary for this as well, weren't you? Yeah. Uh, let's take a look at the clip. Nine, nine, come here. Two Saracens teammates. Josh, Both if you with want new to spoil kits. Rugby, I can put you on the side of the pitch. Leave each other alone because they're working hard to do something. Yeah. You're spoiling it now. Same scrum, ladies. Apologies, the nines are being children at the moment. <laughs> Why do they not? Good? Yeah, but watching <laughs> children's not good, is it? <laughs> <laughs> oh, a wonderful exchange. Not first between Nikki O'Donnell calling the two nines children, and then Amy Kikane. If you didn't pick that up on the ref mark, so when are they not being children? I love it. I just absolutely love it. The fact that the players are getting stuck into them as well, you know, behaving like children. What did you make of it? Yeah, so at the time, um, I think Nathan and I were on comms and we were both just laughing. Like, we didn't really know what to say because we were like, this is actually happening. But it was just brilliant. I think Amy Cocaine's comment after the game, um, sorry, during the, the live stream as well, like, you just picked up on it. Like, Nathan, draw your attention to it. But just brilliant that she's like, yeah, when are they not children? Because it is kind of like that. Like, as a scrum half, you always have a little bit of something with someone else. Normally, they're the most annoying people on the pitch. I know some people think that about me when I play them. So, <laughs> yeah, like, it is. It is quite funny that it's actually been highlighted. So fair play to Nikki O'Donnell for for pulling them out on that. Yeah, I was going to say, is that like part of the unwritten job description for a scrum half? <laughs> that at some Without point <laughs> you, you either get in trouble with the ref or you wind up the opposition players. Any scrum half I've played with, at some point, it's like there he goes again. Like just wind it. In Do you know bit. what though? Like you don't even mean to. Like I know that I irritate people when I play, but. I don't even mean to, like I just am so invested in the game that I almost like commentate the ref at the same time. <laughs> so if people are off their feet, I just say it. Cause I'm like, they're off their feet. And like, 
I don't try and do it in a way that like, I want the penalty or I want the ref to get annoyed at me, but it's just the way that you play because you're just constantly talking the whole time. So Game management, I like yeah, it. Yeah, it's got to be done. <laughs> but no, it is, it's definitely a thing. And uh, the amount of times I've been told how annoying I am on the pitch, like I think most nines feel like that. So yeah, I think it is part and parcel. Oh, we love it. We absolutely love it. Uh, now, Sail Shark swinger Jodie Ounsley was born profoundly deaf. Now she's ripping it up on the wing for Sail Sharks and Great Britain Sevens. Take a look. Tuleri Wynne Davis with the pass. Laura Perrin tries a kick through. Now here goes Jodie Ounsley. Is Ounsley in? Yes, she is. You're not going to stop Jodie Ounsley from that range. Straight away, I think I had a bit of a fire in me. I think I was very competitive, but I also had a lot of frustration in me as well because I was basically profoundly deaf from birth. So that basically means no hearing whatsoever, completely, you know, deaf in both ears. Obviously with my disability, being young and not being able to communicate with my parents, I think built up like a lot of passion and anger. So that's helped me obviously now in my rugby career, but as a kid, I just wanted to get stuck into anything, really. I got a cochlear implant fitted when I was 14 months old, but as a kid, I don't remember sort of letting it hold me back. I just seemed to thought, no, it's not gonna stop me. I'm just gonna crack on and do what I want. But I remember weirdly going around the playground, <laughs> telling people I've got a robot ear and saying that they took my ear off and put a new robot ear on. So yeah, I feel like I just were good at sort of getting on with it almost. My parents, honestly, they're just, I wouldn't be the person I am today without them basically. And when they basically got told by the doctor, your daughter's profoundly deaf and might not be able to have a conversation with you, they didn't know what to do with that information. So they literally sort of switched into the parents they are and thought, no, we're gonna find a way, we're gonna you know, support her in any way possible. And that's what they did. But my dad's come from a fighting background and he's also been in the police for 30 years and then won multiple titles in MMA and Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. But he's also the world champion in the Coal Carry On Championships as well. So as bizarre as it sounds, it's literally a Yorkshire event where you run with a sack of coal on your back and you run for like a mile. So he always says when I was younger, I randomly got a sack of carrots, put them on my shoulders and sprinting around the kitchen. And my dad said, right, I think she's gonna stop now. But he said, I just kept running around like a crazy little kid. And he always says that sort of where if thought there was some spark in me that I'm gonna enjoy sports or be an athlete. So I saw him putting so much effort in, training all the time. And weirdly enough, I really enjoy and do that too. And I always wanted to train with him. So we sort of really bonded over it and just trained together. And then I think that's obviously put me into a sporting background as well. So it's had a massive impact on me. We wasn't a rugby family, we weren't a big rugby family, but something drew to me and I don't quite know what it was but my younger brother started playing and seeing him play I thought you know I want to give that a go I want to try rugby but my parents wouldn't allow me to do that because doctors say you know people with cochlear implants can't do contact sports just with the risks that come with it so we looked into it we looked in different ways sort of safety measures and whatnot and came across a scrum cap so my dad were thinking I'll get a scrum cap and then do a session and then get it out of my system and just forget about it. But it was the complete opposite and five years later, we're still here. So that's literally how it started. I got invited into the England Seven setup, but obviously with COVID, sort of that changed and meant I moved back home, I moved back up north. And then this was the year when sale was starting and I just thought this could not be a better opportunity. So coming here, I was, I was honestly so nervous, but everyone's just so lovely and so driven and hard working and the girls just literally have each of us back. Sail Sharks is all about passion, you know, drive and constantly if we get knocked back, we get up and go again. And I just love that. Everyone's just so willing to work hard. And even if we're not at the top of the league, that doesn't matter. We know what we want to do. We know what we want to achieve and we have each of us back. And just that 
passion is, yeah, uh, it's just a great environment to be around and yeah, I love it. And then to have Katie as well, and now, you know, having a big role, it's, it's honestly amazing. And just to see what we can build in the next couple of years, it just, it's so exciting. With my cochlear implant on, it's not, you know, amazing hearing or anything like that. That's literally, I'm relying on lip reading. So all the time when I'm speaking to someone, I'm communicating by reading your lips and your body language. So when you throw me onto a rugby pitch, a team sport, everyone communicating and shouting, it's a complete nightmare. <laughs> but the team have just been willing to be adaptive, if that makes sense. They're willing to learn more about how they can support me because, you know, every deaf person has different experiences, but just me being open and they're willing, wanting to learn about what it's like and just little things like that literally help me massively. I don't know where it's come from, it's just always been in my head, yeah, I want to be an Olympian. And then when Rugby Sevens were introduced in Rio 2016, that was just like, this feels real now. Rugby in the Olympics, this is really something I want to do now. And yeah, it's something I'm working towards every day. But to be honest, I just want to achieve as much as possible, whether it's in 15s or 7s. I just love rugby. I just love being getting stuck in. So I'm just willing to achieve as much as I can, to be honest, whatever that may be. Just how impressive is Jodie? It's, it almost feels patronising to say it, it's inspiring because actually she is just doing whatever she wants to do, whatever she's capable of. It's incredible to see and her attitude to it as well and how, how much she is inspiring. Uh, you know, other people who've been born perhaps profoundly deaf or with partial hearing, it's, it's amazing, isn't it? Oh, it's just incredible. And like the way that she goes about it as well, it's not like, as you say, it's not something that you need to do anything but celebrate because of the way that she portrays herself, how she talks about it, how, how amazing she is with everyone else. I think like the following that she's now got from like both parents and young kids that have potentially a disability that want to get involved in stuff is just brilliant and that's what you want like you want people like that in our sport celebrating our sport and hats off to her she's just an amazing individual so yeah like keep it up Jodie whatever you're doing is just amazing yeah I'd echo that 100% I mean it's just a brilliant inspiring story to see and you know for anybody watching dis disabled or not who feels that maybe there isn't a place for them in the sport I think Jodie is a brilliant example of actually with a bit of perseverance and resilience there's always a way to solve the problem and you know, she's been amazing in that. She's figured out a way to play rugby at the highest level, to play internationally as well, to find ways to communicate that works for her. And her teammates have been fully supportive of that and the community as well. You know, Sail Sharks are doing some brilliant, brilliant work in their community and she's at the forefront of that. So, I mean, I, I can't speak highly enough of her, you know, watching her as a player, but understanding her off the pitch now as well. It's just a brilliant story. You've obviously maybe crossed paths with her in the sevens and the fifteens programme or or perhaps know some of the women who have played with her and, and seen firsthand how she's adapted herself to the game and how the game is able to adapt around her and her needs. Yeah, it's brilliant. Like I haven't personally played with her, but I know that all the girls speak really highly of her. Like she's a, a brilliant asset to any team, which obviously shines through with the personality that she's got. But I just think not only in rugby, like this story is something that people can like grasp hold of in all walks of life. Like if you truly want something, you want to go after it. Everyone always says it, but like, go and get it. Like, th she's such a great example, like literally personified, like her doing that. So yeah, amazing work from her. Well, yeah, it's brilliant. Rugby is such an inclusive sport. The AP15s is now in its fifth season. And with that, it's becoming more diverse. We're seeing more and more international talent coming over and playing in the English league. What do you make of it? It adds a lot of character adds a lot of culture, adds a lot of different ideas. And you see it, you know, I've experienced it at London Irish. You know, we had players from all over the world and it actually allows you to celebrate that culture as well. You know, we had a big, big Samoan, a Pacific Island influence and you just enjoy their company so, so much for what they bring, not just on the pitch, but off it as well. So I think you, you add in that mix of new ideas, different ways of seeing the game as well. And you just make your team and your club a better place. So you can see now what's happening in the Premier 15s with international talent coming from overseas. They want to be a part of what's going on over here. But then actually, once you get to understand them, you understand their stories, their backgrounds. I mean, it, it just makes things much, much better. So it's really good to see. It shows that what we're doing here is working at the minute and we're just going to get a better game from it as a result.
Yeah, hundred percent. And just the intensity of training, everything else, and also you have different ideas. So a lot of these players are international. They've been in different international setups under different international coaches. So like you were mentioning, all those different ideas, and also the intensity, all of that sort of thing is playing part in it as well. And bringing all of that stuff into different clubs is just brilliant. And you've also got the links across the clubs. So you've got like some of the USA girls across all of the clubs in the league. So you get that comparison as well, which I think is really nice for them. But yeah, it's brilliant. It's just driving this league forward and forward and yeah, may m may it continue, that's all I say. It's going to get real interesting as well when the internationals start as well because then everyone's going to go off, come against each other, going to come and clash heads. But again, it's going to actually make... Hopefully not literally. <laughs> not literally. <laughs> <laughs> Don't do that. Don't do that. <laughs> so, but like you say, that, that competitive edge now coming together, they're going to go away to their countries and then come back. The World Cup's coming. So, I mean, it, it's great. It's really good to see. Yeah, Just it's exciting. don't run into each other. Yeah. I know. <laughs> <laughs> it's exciting to see, isn't it? That's what we think. Let's get now a truly international flavour of the AP15s. Hey, jag heter Maja Muller. Jag kommer från Vänersborg i Sverige och spelar för Lafpro Lightning. Konnichiwa, Kato Sachiko desu. Nihon no Nagoya shushin desu. Watashi wa ima my name is Alicia Washington and I am from Connecticut, USA, and I play for Worcester Warriors. So luckily enough, where I'm from in the States, like two hours away, there is a Worcester, Massachusetts. So I have always grown up saying Worcester, never Worcester. I wanted to come to Worcester because of the city feel, but also you can get like suburban and rural pretty quickly where I am now in New Haven, like you can go in and like see all the beauty of Yale University and have all the shops and all the eating, but then you can very quickly head into the suburbs or, you know, have a little bit more rural feel. Like it does feel like home so quickly here, which was a really great feeling to have. In Nagoya, there is so many people and so many cars and buildings. It's so different with uh, UK. I can go hiking and I can go to the beach. My town is based in the south end of a really big lake. Uh, so a lot of water, woods, like everyone knows each other, basically. It's that small. Last year, I had an opportunity to come here to study. It's quite similar in a lot of ways that it's a small town still. You don't know everyone in this town, obviously, but like I love the campus, the opportunities for sports you have here. It's quite similar in a lot of ways, but still very different as well. Phillips in far too much space here from a sale point of view, finds Washington, Alicia Washington on debut, scores! I think it's the best competition in the world. I was just, just so blown away by the talent in this league. Everyone is on a trajectory and their talent suits playing for their country. We have so many international players in Exeter Chiefs. In Japan, I was not able to experience like this high-level rugby. The girls uh, faster and more physical than Japan and yeah, it's so high level. There were just so many areas of the game I wasn't aware of before coming here. It's just like a big opportunity to get like quality game time to just develop and improve. You are all lovely and I would say a lot more blunt than Americans. Um, we tend to sugarcoat things, but I didn't know until I came here. And my teammates were like, well, why'd you do that? <laughs> I'm like, okay, I won't do it again. <laughs> I feel like they're all about carbs here. It's like <laughs> pies, bread, pastries, a lot of potatoes. I love potatoes though. English breakfast is like such a strange thing for me. I like eggs and I like potatoes, but potatoes, that's not breakfast and Swedish meatballs. Because what people over here call Swedish meatballs isn't really Swedish meatballs. They do it wrong. I just want to say that. <laughs> Honestly, I like UK puddings. <laughs> I like cream tea scones with grotted cream with strawberry jam. But I, I'm, I'm a athlete, so I don't really often have them. I love the sarcasm. I love um, just constantly need to be on my toes and have like quips and wit ready. I think I'm keeping up. I hope. I mean, I won't know if I'm not, but I hope I am. <laughs> well, there we go. The international flavour in the AP15s, as strong as ever.
Mo Topsy, you've witnessed all there is to see in rugby in, in various levels and indeed in both the men's and the women's arm of the sport as well. How does having these cultural differences and, and players from around the world impact you as a squad? I think for me, like I mentioned it earlier, but that extra bit this year, the intensity and everything else, I think that comes from having so many varied internationals across the board in so many different clubs. Like you look now and it used to be just English players pretty much, maybe with the odd Welsh, Scottish, Irish international involved. But now you see players coming across from Canada, from America, a little bit of chat coming out of New Zealand as well, potentially uh, coming into our league. So. It really is diversifying it, but it's also adding to that intensity. And I think each club is doing it in their own right. And it's just brilliant to see and where this game's going, because it's definitely one of the top, if not the top league for women's rugby in the whole w in the world, I'd say. Yeah, and it actually it helps you build better relationships because you do go out of your way to understand the new cultures from players coming from abroad. You know, I remember from experience, you know, we would celebrate Thanksgiving with our American players because it'd be like that was a big deal for them so we would get around the table we would eat they would host of course so it was oh, okay <laughs> fine I'll come around I'll come it's eat. It's an excuse to be cooked for Absolutely right? <laughs> but you would do it and then even at Christmas you know it's easy for us we're home we can go off and see our families if you're not from here you can't do that so again loads of guys would get together they'd go to the club they'd all sit around they'd all share meals share all different recipes and stuff and when you spend that much time together off the pitch as well it's only going to help you when you are on the pitch because it goes beyond teammates you do kind of become family because you understand them, you know, you know their background, you know their culture, their heritage. So, I mean, that, that was a side, again, from experience I really enjoyed, you know, understanding different walks of life and it did make for a really enjoyable team to play for. It's important, isn't it, as well? Like, I know that there's a huge Scottish contingent at Loughborough and they do Burns Night, like, they celebrate it quite well. I think the girls, like, cooked and sent loads of Tupperware out to the whole squad. They jumped on Zoom. Like, stuff like that is just, it's really heartwarming and it's really important to do. So, yeah, it's, um, it is important. Now we are five rounds into this season, so let's take a quick look at the AP15's table so far. Mo and Topsy, your thoughts on it, please. Bristol are top, unbeaten. Saracens also unbeaten. Loughborough Lightning, semi-finalists last year, of course, it's struggling somewhat. Yeah, it's, uh, it's good to see, I guess, from a neutral point of view, that disruption to what was maybe our established order of top four teams. You know, Bristol and Saracens definitely setting the pace, but then you look at the rest and, you know, anybody can beat anybody on their day. Um, 200 plus tries scored as well across the league, which is great across those five rounds. So we touched on it earlier, just how competitive it is. And I think as the season goes on, teams will get stronger. And there's going to be a real sprint to the finish line to get into those playoffs to challenge for the trophy. So enjoying every minute of it so far. Like I say, it, it's, it's so unpredictable. And I think that's what makes it exciting. You know, teams are going out and you can flip a coin and think, right, who's going to win this? And with the quality of players, the quality of play from all the teams, it's just made it for a real enjoyable spectacle to watch. Did you expect Bristol to be top at this point in the season? No. <laughs> but I expected big things from them because I saw the work they did in the off-season. I saw the signings they made, new head coach, a couple of Red Roses joining. So you knew what they were capable of. Add to that some, some players returning from injury. So I'm now not surprised that they are at the top because things have clicked. They had the infrastructure. We look at the Bears training facility and you know, they've really invested in that side of things to make sure that they can deliver on the pitch and then doing that in spades. Yeah, not only the Red Roses that are there, they've got like a huge Welsh contingent as well that are all playing some brilliant rugby. So you look at Alicia Butchers, who we don't talk about a lot, and there's Jazz Joyce, obviously. And yeah, they've got some brilliant like, players down there. Like you say, it's all clicking and having Sarah Byrne on the pitch, you're always going to get go forward ball. So they're doing wonderful things down there for sure. Defending champions Harlequins, who kindly lent us uh, the trophy for today. Mid-table at the moment, they've lost twice at home as well. What isn't quite clicking there, do you think? I'm not sure quite clicking. I think just pressure. Pressure, quality of opposition. You know, they've lost two tough fixtures, won some tough fixtures. And when you're the defending champions, you're always going to have a target on your back. No need to panic, you know, I mean, they got a lucky win away at Gloucester Hartbury. Sorry, Mo, I think we are going <laughs> through, aren't we? Commentating on that game, I thought you had it done. Yeah. Um, but they, and so they, they showed kind of that champion mentality, that spirit there. Um, but it's going to be the case through the season because they are the defending champions and all the other teams are going to want to take that trophy off them. So they just need to know that if on any day they're not at the races, they're there for the taking give you a chance to defend yourself <laughs> and Gloucester Hartbury. You've had two close matches that could easily have gone the other way. Yeah. And, and if you'd had those results, it would look a bit different, wouldn't it? 
I think if we were still playing the same laws in the league as last year where we stopped after 70 minutes, we'd have beaten <laughs> Bristol <laughs> and we'd have beaten... Um, That's it, change the laws. Yeah, and beaten Harlequin. So I think like for our perspective, like it's a really disappointing start because we kind of let ourselves down in the dying minutes of both of those games, like a try at the end of both of them and it would have been the other way otherwise. So yeah, a tough one to take, but I think... Um, it's it's just amazing. Like we th like the league itself. Like we were up eighteen seven to Harlequins at half time. Like and the one try that they scored was Eddie Kildan, brilliant line. But there was no way that she should have scored it. Like our defence was poor. It was in between me and one of the other girls. Um. So yeah, it's just like the intensity and how quickly it's now like flipping on a switch. Like you think these games are done and they're just not because you've got players that can score from anywhere. Like your Abby Dowles when we talk about Wasps. So yeah, it's a really interesting one for me. Loughborough Lightning, I don't think they need to worry too much at the minute. Like They've had a lot of their international girls in terms of the Scottish girls not be available for selection because of their World Cup qualifiers. Um, so yeah, they're going to they're gonna be able to turn the, it around in the season and obviously losing Emily Scarrett has been huge for them as well. But I'm sure that they'll find some of the youngsters coming through and they'll filter into that. So I don't think they need to panic. It is um, warning signs, but yeah, they'll be all right. And last season we were talking up Exeter fourth at the moment your thoughts on them this season so far they've just started where they left off haven't they i think the thing about them is they don't have any of these preconceptions with the the big two so your harlequins and your saracens whereas potentially other teams that have come up against them for the fifth time they know how hard they are to beat and they've got that stubbornness about them whereas Exeter don't have that and a player like Delika Menin going down there from Loughborough she's made a huge impact like what she's doing for that squad has just been brilliant and obviously they always recruit well they've signed a lot of international players and fair play to them that's a way to do it and, and they're doing it really well so it looks like a good setup down there and they're, they're carrying on where they left off. Yeah that's the really impressive thing about it in a short space of time what they've been able to build so very nearly got into those playoffs last season and we're very blunt in saying that's our target, that's what we're going for. And so far, so good for them, tracking really well, quality squad, great facilities, great infrastructure as well, everything you kind of need to then get things right on the pitch. So looking good for them so far. We shall see what the rest of the season has in store. OK, try and visualise the dynamic here. Scrum half Claudia McDonald and hooker Cleena Maloney live together. They train and play together at Wasps. Claude's also the club captain. Pretty soon, they could be facing each other on the international stage. How on earth do they make it work? We found out. Hey, I'm Claude. I'm Glee. Right, come on in. Uh, if I was to describe Claude in three words, it would be giggly, competitive, and compassionate. Aww, that's cute! I'll take that. Okay, if I was to describe Clee in three words, it would be funny, or hilarious, because you are very funny. Two would be stubborn, and three, selfless, always looking out for other people. <laughs> Together three years. The first time we met was, I think it was at a pre-season tour, wasn't it? So we were going to the Alps with wasps. Mm -hmm. I rocked up, she was moody, I was chaffy, trying to make friends with everyone. And she kind of skulked around in the corner, didn't talk to anyone, so... That's not true. <laughs> I was on the job. She was teaching me how to scrum the other day in the kitchen. <laughs> <laughs> I fancy myself as a hooker, and yeah. I don't fancy myself as one anymore. Well, <laughs> well Claude wanted to know. So I was like, OK, come on then. <laughs> She's got a really tough head and really strong. <laughs> I was literally like crumpled like this, like, oh, it hurts. <laughs> I love it. Like, I wouldn't want to play on any other team when I wasn't playing with you. So I love playing with you. It's, it's good fun. That sounds naughty. <laughs> <laughs> if we're not really serious about rugby, we're probably ridiculously stupid <laughs> playing children's games or outside playing table tennis or... I play a lot of table tennis. A lot of table tennis. Clea hadn't played table tennis before about a year ago and I played a game with her playing with my left hand and she played with her right hand and she didn't notice till the end of the game and she was not a happy bunny because I still won. <laughs> yeah, you've played for how long, Claude? Yeah. You've got a table at your house. I've never played before. Living and working day to day with the club captain. Yeah, it can be intense. We both need to switch off, but um, it's about probably doing stuff like this that we end up fighting about then. 
to distract us, really. The other day, you did question my general captaincy style. <laughs> and I was like, do you actually think about what you say as a captain? Because maybe you should write some stuff down and start thinking about it. It, like, sounded, you know, just... it sounds much worse now, but you're, you're taking this out of context. So obviously, this is the kitchen. Um, well, this is where the action happens. Cleaner. <laughs> Show that! <laughs> this is the better cupboard. Wait, where's the healthy cupboard? That one. The maybe the protein in there. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, it's oh. slightly better, look. The nutrition stuff. If I cook, it's going to be a chicken pie, a roast dinner. No. If you cook, it's going to be something with copious amounts of butter. Mash. So if a serving says it's for four, it's actually for two. <laughs> <laughs> and that is why we're getting bigger and stronger. <laughs> This is the bedroom, obviously. We've got our two resident teddies, Hamish and Bluey. And these were very kindly knitted for us by Kira Cooney's mum, and they're fab, we love them. Do you remember that birthday you had? And my grandma, it was like when she didn't really know you that well, and she bought you that those clothes from her. Oh, yeah. oh, there's a cat, there's a cat, there's a cat! Oh my God, there's a cat! Oh, there's a cat in the house! <laughs> Where the heck did he come from? He has walked in the house. He took a poo in the garden as well. We don't have a cat. <laughs> and there was a cat in the house. <laughs> I don't like cats, they really kind of freak me out. So yeah, next year could be the first time we face each other in the Six Nations internationally, which would be pretty cool, pretty exciting. It's been in the pipeline the whole time we've been together yeah. and it's never actually like fruitioned into a game of us actually playing against each other. So one side of me is excited, like, Hopefully, we'll at some you know, not many couples actually get to do that, do they? Like, yeah. play an international game where you're both on opposite sides of the pitch and you both want different things. Like, we've always said, you know, obviously, we both want to win the game, but we both want to win the game and the other person play well. So, I want England to win, but I want Clee to play well. And I'm sure Clee would say she wants Ireland to win, but hopefully, she wants me to play well. <laughs> I don't know, that's what I say. <laughs> All packed, off to Twyford and training for the evening. I drive because I'm too fast. We'll get there too early if I drive. <laughs> because Clee likes to dart through all the traffic and I mostly sit in it. Let's have a kitty. I want to have a kitty. <laughs> when we get there, we've got headshots. Yep. So she. In the boat. The change in the women's game in the last five years since. Since the start of the new Premier 15s as it is now, I think it's been enormous. The commitment and the dedication from the players, I think on the whole, has massively increased. A lot of players have come over from, from Ireland to the UK to challenge themselves, number one, but also to get competitive, not only competitive fixtures every weekend, but competitive training sessions, not just twice a week, but three, four, five times a week with the amount of talent that's here from across the world. So it's, it's everything really. It's even just a professional feel around club and better access to better coaches, playing with better players all the time. Oh, it's just so intense, isn't it? Can you imagine being with your partner for 24 seven and especially under the pressure of elite rugby as well? Yeah, that is, that's a unique situation, but it's almost testament to, I guess, how good their relationship is that they're able to do that because, you know, a lot of couples say, oh, you know, we can't be all over each other that much. We need space, we need space. These guys, <laughs> they don't get it because they live and work together. So it's just having a really good understanding of your partner, you know, when times are right, you need to be on your own, I need to be on my own. But in and amongst that, they've got to go to work together. They've got to come home together. They have a laugh. You see the dynamic there. It's great to see. And, you know, we wish them all the best come Six Nations because if they're playing against each other, things could get interesting <laughs> come Spicy. that time of the year. Yeah, I definitely. think that one's going to be the tough one, isn't it? But like for me, it's just all about their communication. They clearly know each other very well. So just making sure that they're like really on it with that and making sure that they don't bring rugby to home. I think that would be huge as well. But yeah, I think if uh, it was me and someone was telling me about my captaincy, I'm not sure how one, that one went down. Obviously, Claude's doing an amazing job in the absence of Kate Older, and that's like huge shoes to fill. So I'm sure that she's genuinely deep down, like happy of that little bit of guidance as well. If in doubt, table tennis. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Just not left-handed. No, not left-handed. <laughs>
Well, that's almost it for today's episode. While well, we've got you both, finally, where do you see the AP15 season going in the next few months? In the short term, I see Bristol and Saracens continuing to set the pace. I, I think, you know, they're the standard bearers at the minute and teams will do very well to knock them over. For the rest, I, I think more of the same, just because we're getting into this period now, you know, with internationals, with gaps in the league programme, that form's going to fluctuate a bit. The winter's coming as well, it's going to get wet, it's going to get cold. So the ability to adapt to that through those colder months and then be in a good shape come that final sprint towards the finish line. So I, I think it's going to be very unpredictable in that middle pack as we've seen so far. Um, but again, keeps it exciting because we, we just don't know what's coming. I think, you know, Saracens are Bristol at the top and they're the ones to chase down. Everybody needs to dig in and be in a good position come the spring when things get a bit warmer, a bit more settled and that sprint finish to the final. Yeah, I think for me as well, you've got a gruelling international window now. I think England playing four games, you've got Wales playing four games as well. So how all of those internationals come out of that and come back into the club will be really interesting to see. But bonus points are huge in the league at the minute. I think we've talked about it previously in the women's game. It's never really come to fruition. You've never really had to chase them so much. But at the moment, you look at that middle bit of the table and they're so important. So who can keep getting those four tries? Who can keep getting that Luna uh, losing bonus points? Sorry, I think will be super important come the final bit of the season. So it's interesting and it's exciting and it's, it's brilliant to be part of, to be honest. Absolutely. Thank you both so much for all of your expertise and insight today. That is it. That's all we have time for. The Alliance Premier 15 season begins once again after the international break on Saturday, the 27th of November. We'll see you then.